True holiness has a lot to do with the commands of God, the precepts of God, the wisdom of God, because we do not know properly how to love God except through what is written. But my dear friend, the only way we can be a holy people is to be a gospel people. I sometimes feel like I'm I'm afraid to take a step one way or the other. I know I do not want the highway of the world. I know it's destruction and it's death. But sometimes I'm afraid to walk the highway of holiness. Why? There's an old preacher by the name of Conrad Merle who used to say this. To walk in falsehood is easy. You can walk a thousand miles that way and a thousand miles that way and be in falsehood. But to walk in the truth, to walk in holiness, is like walking on the edge of a razor blade. And you can fall off either side. Antinomianism on one side. And it is deadly. Taking away from what God has said. And legalism on the other side is just as deadly. Adding to what God has said. Said. And I have found that the only way I can make it through this course is keeping my eyes fixed on Christ. Every command, every precept, every bit of wisdom given by the scripture is interpreted to me and illustrated to me by Jesus Christ to follow Christ And when I follow Christ, I see a holiness as he walks toward Jerusalem. And I don't even want to interrupt his thoughts for I'm afraid of him. And yet I see him bowing to pick up children or allowing a filthy prostitute of a woman to touch him. And I see only in him the perfect example that holiness It's manifested in love toward God and love toward everyone else. And he is not only holy in his holiness, but he's holy in his love. He's not just holy in his justice. He's holy in his mercy and his grace. The same grace that has caused him to bear with a fool like me for over 30 years. I want to be holy. But I want to make sure I know what that means. I know the motivation for holiness. It is Christ. I know the example of holiness is Christ. I know the goal of all holiness is Christ. And Christ as he is so greatly revealed in the gospel. There is only one attribute of God that is being declared around the throne day and night, day and night, that is being raised to the superlative degree, and that is the holiness of God. As you know, the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. Uh, to raise something to the superlative degree, one would repeat it three times. And in reality, what the angels are saying is that God is holy, He is holier than any of His works and any of His creatures, but more than that, He is the holiest of all beings, that He is elevated to the very highest level of holiness. He Himself is perfectly holy. Now, this attribute is uniquely singled out by being repeated again and again and again. Uh, The angels are not crying out, love, 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 although God is love, as we will see in a future lesson. Uh, The angels are not crying out, truth, 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 although unmistakably, God is truth. Nor are they crying out, wrath, 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 although God is a God of vengeance and judgment. Instead, what the angels are crying out is, holy, holy, holy. I think we can say that more than any other attribute, God is identified in heaven by His holiness. Everything about God is holy. His Son is His Holy Son. His Spirit is the Holy Spirit. His Word is the Holy Bible. His temple is the Holy Temple. His mount is the Holy Mount Zion. Uh, The The land that He gave to His people is the holy land. 
everything about God, the Alpha and the Omega, it is marked by His holiness. So what does the word holy mean as it relates to God? What does this signify when the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy? So I want us to begin with the primary meaning of the holiness of God. This means that God is separated above His creation. Uh, The word holy simply means to separate, uh, to cut, to cut something in, in two so that the two sides are now distant and removed. The holiness of God means that God is set apart from His creation, that He is separated above His creation. We're not on His level. He is on a level distinctly and infinitely above us. Holiness means that God is elevated above us. He is distinct from us. He is superior to us. He is a cut above us. He is wholly other than us. Uh, This is the idea of holiness. And interwoven with this is that He is high and lifted up, that God is transcendent, that God is exalted in glory far above us. Uh, that God is uh, supreme in His greatness compared to all of the works of His hands. Uh, There is the idea of royalty and regalness and dignity of this splendor of God in His holiness. He is majestic as He is elevated above us. He is robed in regal splendor. He is dazzling in His kingly glory. This is what it means for God to be holy. We are merely pedestrian compared to this exalted God. Exodus 15 verse 11 is one of the first verses to use this word holy and combines with it this idea of kingly majesty as though He is far above us and robed in splendor. Exodus 15, 11 says, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you? Listen to this now. Majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. This is to say that that God in His exalted holiness is awe-inspiring. We cannot look upon God in His holiness and and yawn and be bored. Then we didn't see Him because God in His holiness is stunning. He is staggering, breathtaking, so magnificent in the beauty of His holiness that it is mind-boggling to mere creatures to gaze upon His attributes and to contemplate the majesty that belongs to Him alone. We say today in addressing uh, the Queen of England, for example, we, I, we address her as Your Majesty, as she is in her palace or in her castle, as she is surrounded by attendants and, and she is attired in royal robes. Infinitely more so is God, dressed in glory, enthralled in splendor uh, in His throne above. 1 Samuel 2 verse 2 says, There is no one holy like the Lord. In other words, His holiness is so far removed from us that there is no comparison that can be made to God. He is incomparable in His holiness. Indeed, there is no one like you. He is entirely unique. He is so high and exalted, so majestic. Psalm 22 verse 3 combines this idea of the holiness of God and being enthroned in majesty. It says, you are holy. You who are enthroned upon the praises 
of Israel. Again, this idea that holiness represents the exaltation and the magnification and the enthronement of God being high and lifted up. In this sense, it touches upon the idea even of His sovereignty, that He is supreme in His glory. And then He said, over the throne and above Yahweh and Adonai, the Lord, were the seraphim, each with six wings. This is the only reference in Scripture to these creatures who are called seraphim. Some have tried to identify them exactly with the cherubim, but I think since the Bible distinguishes, we need to distinguish them. We know very little about them except that they are part of the heavenly host, those beings that were especially created by God to serve Him day and night in His immediate presence. And if we read the description that Isaiah gives of them, it seems as though they appear in almost bizarre fashion, for we are told that they had six wings. Well, let me just stop here for a second and make a comment. When God creates creatures, He does it with a certain creative economy. He doesn't waste material. He has an amazing, extraordinary ability to create whatever he makes in such a way that it is adaptable and suitable for its environment. God makes fish with gills and with fins because their natural habitat is in the water. He makes birds with wings and feathers because their environment is in the air. And so when he creates angelic beings whose specific task and function in creation is to minister to him in his immediate presence, he constructs them in such a way as to make them fit for their environment. And hence we are told they are given two extra sets of wings. With two, they cover their face. Think of it that these angelic beings minister daily in the immediate unveiled presence of Almighty God, whose glory is so refulgent, so piercing, that even the angels have to shield themselves from looking directly at His face. You know, throughout your life, there are going to be so many questions that you can't answer. Why did my child die? Why did my friend have to hurt so severely? Why was this good brother maligned? And you're not going to have an answer. But you don't need to have an answer if you know the Lord. If a man that I greatly trusted ran into this building right now and, and said, give me the keys to your car, I would pull out my keys and throw him the keys and not ask him what he was going to do with my car because I would know his character. In the same way, I don't have to know what God is doing, why God is doing it, or how long it will last. I just need to know who God is. I just constantly find myself in need of a greater vision of God. When I am loveless, I need a greater vision of God. When the world pulls at me, and I want you to know it does, I need a greater vision of God. For every malady, I find a cure, a greater vision of God in Christ, in the gospel of Christ. Remember the story in the book of Exodus when Moses, representing the people of God, was summoned by Yahweh to Sinai to receive the law of God. And you remember, Moses went up there into the clouds and was sort of swallowed up on that mountain. And the people waited for days and after days, and they were apprehensive and stricken with anxiety as they wondered what had happened to their leader had he been swallowed up by the wrath of God on that mountain like Korah and his people had in the rebellion. Would he return alive? What would the message of God be if he did come back? And so they waited in fear and trembling for Moses returned. And while Moses was on the mountain, he spoke with God. You remember the conversation? 
If I can improvise a little bit, it, was, it went something like this. Moses said to God, he said, God, I have seen some magnificent things in my lifetime. You've shown me uh, the burning bush. I've seen the plagues by which you devastated the Egyptians. I saw you part the sea and bring a whole nation of people through on dry land. I've seen you provide supernatural, miraculous provisions from heaven for us hungry people. But now let me have the big one. God, please, let me see your face. God said, Moses, you know better than that. You know it's my word that no man shall see me and live. You can't see my face, Moses. Here's what I'll do. I'll carve out a little niche in the rock over here, and I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. And then I will cover you, and I will pass by, and I will let you see my backward parts. The Hebrew reads the hindquarters of Yahweh. But my face shall not be seen. So God put his servant in the cleft of the rock, and he allowed his glory to pass by. And ladies and gentlemen, for a split second, Moses got a backward glance of the refracted glory of God. And what happened? When he came down from the mountain and the people saw this figure approaching in the distance, they became all excited for the return of their leader and they rushed forward to greet Moses. And suddenly they shrunk back in horror and fell on their faces and they began to plead with Moses saying, Moses, Moses, cover your face. They couldn't bear to look at him. Why? Because Moses' face was shining with such radiance and such intensity that it was blinding the people. And what the people were seeing, ladies and gentlemen, think of it, was merely a reflection on a human being's face from a backward, instantaneous glance of the glory of God. And that's the one thing you need to see about holiness, above all other things, is the fact that God is holy, 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 means that he is in a category all to himself. It's not that he is like us, just bigger and better. He's not like us at all. Dear R.C. Sproul, my life was changed by listening to his, years ago, his video series back then of the holiness of God. And when he asked this question, what's more like God? The great seraphim in heaven or a worm? And he said, the answer is neither. Neither one of them is like God. There is no one like the Lord. That's why anything you can conceive in your mind is not what he is. He is far greater. That's why any attempt to replicate him, either in picture or statue, is a defamation. It is a twisting. It's like years ago, someone told me a missionary was handing out tracts in India. And on the track, it had a picture drawn on the back of an artist rendition of Jesus' face. And they handed out this, this track to this young Indian girl who had become a Christian a few weeks before. And she took the track, thanked them, and walked off. She came back about 10 minutes later, weeping, broken, crying. And the missionary said, what's wrong? And she turned the track around and showed the picture. And she said, oh, sir. I thought he was much more glorious than this. That's why even the prophets are so careful. You hear of a robe. You hear of a throne. You hear of attendance. But little is said about him. Because he can not be comprehended or conceived. In the presence of such a holy God. And Isaiah says, woe is me. Judged is me, damned is me, cursed is me. To be in the presence of such an infinitely holy God. Isaiah was not comparing himself to anyone else in his day or in his time and assuming I'm a little bit better than this person or that person. He was measuring himself against the standard of God's infinitely, absolutely perfect holiness. Woe is me, for I am ruined. I, I am undone. I am disintegrating and coming apart from the inside. I'm unraveling like a cheap sweater in the presence of this God, 
for I'm a man of unclean lips. We would say, Isaiah, that's the best part about you. You're a prophet. Your lips, they speak the word of God. You are the trumpet of God, the voice of God upon the earth. I'm a man of unclean lips because I'm a man with an unclean heart and my lips simply speak out of the depths of my heart and I live among a people of unclean lips. How do you know this, Isaiah? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It is a devastating experience to gaze upon the holiness of God. It melts us down. It shakes us down. You remember when Peter recognized after the miraculous catch of fish that he was standing in the presence of holy God. He said, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. You remember John on the island of Patmos He heard that voice speaking behind him and he turned to see the one who was speaking to him and he saw the glorified Christ in his holiness. And verse 17 says, he fell at his feet like a dead man. You know what that means? He just fainted. He went unconscious. He he suddenly lost his senses to even look upon the holiness of God. If God were to appear in this room in His holiness, we would all just go unconscious. We wouldn't be able to bear it up. That is why when we go to heaven, we have to have a glorified body with glorified eyes to even be able to look upon this holy, awesome, glorified God in heaven or we would burn up like a cinder in His very presence. This is the primary meaning of the holiness of God. And the church has always been strongest when it's had its highest regard for the holiness of God. And those times and epochs when the church has been weakest has been those times when it has lost a sense of the vertical holiness of God and want to bring God down to our level, and everything is a horizontal type relationship with God, that is when the church has been the weakest, if not even unregenerate. The primary meaning is His transcendent, awesome glory. Well, listen to Eliphaz in in Job 15, 15. Behold, He, that is God, puts no trust in his holy ones, and even the heavens are not pure in his sight. Is, is, is the Bible teaching us that, that the heavens are unclean? Or that these attendants of God are somehow soiled? I don't believe that at all. But what you have to understand is the holiness of any creature, any created thing, is not an inherent holiness. It is a derived holiness. If something is holy, it is only because God made it holy and keeps it holy. Even in heaven one day, we will be holy, but only by continued givings of His grace. He maintains us in holiness. We are not holy unto ourselves. He alone is holy without effort, without exercise. He is holy. Holy. You know, when we talk about God's God's omniscience, it's not just that he knows everything. He knows everything instantaneously, exhaustively, without putting forth effort of calculation. When we say that he is holy or when we say that he is or he exists, he's not like us. He does not have to will to exist. He does not have to work to exist. He simply is. Existence is an attribute. In this case, holiness is not something he has to work at, that he has to maintain. He is holy. And you can enter into a covenant with someone like that. You can trust someone like that. So the one that died for you It's holy, holy, holy. Ladies and gentlemen, there is only one attribute of God that is ever raised.
to the third degree of repetition in Scripture. There is only one characteristic of Almighty God that is communicated in the superlative degree from the mouths of angels where the Bible doesn't simply say that God is holy or even that He's holy, holy, but that He is holy, holy, holy. The Bible doesn't say that God is mercy, mercy, mercy. Or love, 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 or justice, 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 or wrath, wrath, wrath. But that He is holy, holy, holy. This is a dimension of God that consumes His very essence. And when it is manifest to Isaiah, we read that at the sound of the voices of the seraphim, the doorposts, the thresholds of the temple itself shook and began to tremble. Do you hear that? Inanimate, lifeless, unintelligible parts of creation in the presence of the manifestation of the holiness of God had the good sense to be moved. How can we, made in His image, be indifferent or apathetic to His majesty. God alone is holy.